Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zero. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick, and Jeff Lasseter. Visit us at IHateCritics.net, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle is CriticsPod. Follow us there. You can listen to us at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Alexa, all your podcatchers. Please go to Apple Podcasts, though, and rate and review the show, and we will read your review on the air. And then patreon.com slash critics pod, the best way to help support the podcast. Uh, check out our bonus episodes, Friday the 13th uh, commentary track with Jeff and Sean. And then T Public over at IHateCritics.net. Click on the T Public link up in the upper right hand corner. Sean, where can people get your reviews? You can find the archive blog if you want to prove I'm uh, you know, wrong about my own reviews. <laughs> I do it all the time. <laughs> It's on uh, Sean, uh, Sean at the movies dot blogspot dot uh, dot com. And then, uh, oh, on on vocal on horror dot media, uh, I'm posting elements of my uh, hopefully book. Uh, it's coming together. I'm I'm nine movies in to watching all of the uh, theatrical release horror films of the 1990s. And I've got uh, several of the pieces already up. The most recent one was which one was that one? The most recent one was uh, Frankenhooker. Uh, that is up now. Uh, you can check out uh, that and uh, the historical impact of uh, Frankenhooker on 1990s horror. Well, you know what, Sean? You're going to have to come to Midwest Monster Fest this year because uh, the star of Frankenhooker is going to be there. Really? So you can, yeah, yeah, you can the come actual and Frankenhooker. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You can come and be like, hey, you know, I'm writing a book and do you want to talk about it? I definitely want to pass. include interviews in if I can, if it would be possible. My goal, my, 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 uh, my goal is to, I don't know if he's still alive or not. I want to find Adam Simon, the director of uh, Carnosaur and Brain Dead, because I've watched both of his movies and I need to tell him how much, how terrible he, how, what a terrible director. <laughs> <sighs> well, just don't tell Patty Mullen that you hate her or anything. <laughs> I would never. Would never. And Jeff, where can people get your art? Uh, JeffLasseter.com, but please stop sending me scam emails on my site. <laughs> <laughs> Do they want you to advertise jewelry? We get those on the Facebook. Yeah, no, they want me to. Uh, I've gotten three with the exact same wording over the last two weeks. Uh, my anniversary is coming up, and I feel that your artworks might be a wonderful jumping off point for a pieces for a pieces of artworks that I want to do for my, and then it's sometimes it's husband, sometimes it's wife, but it's all, I mean, the, the typos are the same. Um, yeah. It's just a waste of time. <laughs> you give a, uh, I get, I've got, I just want to go back to our Facebook page for a moment because in the Facebook group, we welcomed a new group member and I posted some top topics there. So if you want to check it out, uh, the question of the week I just decided randomly was, uh, what is the movie that you're, that you're ashamed to love or ashamed to enjoy? <laughs> I saw your answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good answer. But yeah. If you, if you haven't joined it, we have a Facebook group, the everyone's a critic um, movie group. We review a podcast Facebook group, and you can join there and, of course, like the Facebook page. You just want to hear a horrible one-star review of our podcast? Oh, oh yeah. Sure. That'd be great. Right. Is it about me? No. No one's... No. Speci- I, they kind of mentioned Sean a little bit, but I think it's unfair. Uh, but I more listen to it for fun, not for to get, a fed- to get upset. Uh, the the head- heading is, this show is Hot Taint Sweat. Uh, the host of the show sounds like a mix of heavy breathing, snuffleupagus, and butthead from Beavis and Butthead. That'd be me. Since the production value is such crap, it sounds like they're doing it in an Applebee's bathroom. I'm waiting for a toilet flush in the background. The host That's isn't very prepared. specific. That is very true. And is so monotone his voice would put the cocaine bear to sleep. The second guy in there, forgive me, I do not know his name reviewed a movie on his future opinion on what it was not what the movie was uh i listened to the cocaine bear podcast and they mixed in jesus revolution too he said the movie was horrible 
not because of the what? movie, but because of what the real life people did 20 years after the movie took place. Uh, and he goes on and on to, to say Jesus Revolution was fine. I saw it. It's not that bad. Uh, it is. That bad. I know. <laughs> well, I hope this person is hate listening. <laughs> but he ends it with, anyway, if you want to listen to a bunch of old dudes pretend they actually know anything about movies, then go listen. <laughs> I, I I think if you're, if you're, uh, if you like Jesus Revolution, you're listening to the wrong fucking show. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this, is, this is not the show for you. <laughs> you know what? That sounds to me a lot like somebody who probably didn't even see Jesus Resolution. They just saw that, you know, like, oh, Jesus. So we're going to make fun of it. You know what? We are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> based on the box office, nobody saw Jesus Revolution. <laughs> so I, it's hard to believe anybody could say that they liked it. Oh, but, so in uh, other words, the director is listening to the podcast. <laughs> and I am totally unprepared in a monotone voice. I'll, I'll own that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, we'll jump into this. Uh, you know, yeah, that's, that's fine. I mean, like, like, you know, if, if you're listening to this and, and in your, at any point in your life, you'd say, you, you say you hate woke again, you're listening to the wrong show. This is not your show. This is not for just... you. You're not going to enjoy what we're talking about tonight, especially. <laughs> <laughs> and this is us just having fun talking about stuff yep. we love. So if you don't like that, I'm sorry, but. You know. All right. Uh, we'll jump right into the show then, and we'll talk about the mother. Oh yeah, the mother. I I almost forgot what movie it was because it's terrible. Uh, it's Jennifer Lopez stars in the mother as a woman who's a uh, trained assassin who uh, was she was pregnant and she gonna have a baby might be the baby of two different terrorists one's a terrorist one's a drug lord i think i i was i was paying attention it's just this movie is just so annoying that i didn't care about what i didn't and the two guys she's she's supposed to have been with are i mean first of all joseph fines is just a a yawn personified (laughs) and the other guy is just overacting to a degree that is just i felt i felt a little embarrassed for him uh she she's got to protect her daughter uh, 12 years later. She had the baby taken from her and pr- put into protection, but they found the baby and she's got to now protect the child is now 12 years old and do all sorts of cool action stuff, you know, and they do the 24 torture bit that, you know, torture doesn't work by the way we've proven it's been scientifically proven not to work, but they do it and it works in this movie because of course it does. She has every skill she needs whenever she needs it. She's a fucking superhero like everybody else. Like, you know, she's they're trying to do like a Jason Bourne stuff here and, and whatnot. And I I gave up there. I gave up about halfway through and just sort of hate watched the rest of it in the background while I did other things, because this movie is just it's just not good. I love Jennifer Lopez. I think she's great. But why is she bothered with something this trite and this just predictable like this and and this level of right-wing nonsense on top of it like just absolute trash uh i don't understand why 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 she wanted to do this she's a better actress than this did you watch it jeff i did not neither did i did I. not you didn't miss anything <laughs> i didn't think it would. i heard that all right what about monica Monica. Now, if you haven't seen this movie, most people haven't seen this movie. This is a movie to see. This is an incredible film uh, directed by Andrea Polaro and uh, starring uh, a brilliant, uh, brilliant actress uh, named Trace Lissette, who uh, her mother, played by Patricia Clarkson, is uh, dying of a brain tumor. And uh, her brother, uh, brother's wife, played by Emily Browning, has tracked her down. They've been estranged for about 20 years. A lot has changed in that time. And she pretty much fears that her mother, who now has a brain tumor, is not going to to recognize her when she comes home. And there are, are many reasons why she might not. Uh, and of course, over the course of the movie, obviously, Trace Lissette is playing a character who is trans. She is a trans woman herself, and she's playing a character who is trans. And of course, she's trying to determine now she's got to make a decision whether or not she's going to explain to her mother who she is or if her mother's just or see if her mother is just going to recognize her somehow through the haze of this disease. 
But one of the incredible things about this movie that they that they do is they never dead name this character. Not one time in the entire movie. Everybody keeps that straight. And I thought so many movies, it uses that as a bit of suspense, like that somebody might do something horrible to her, like or she's just going to be re-traumatized at any moment by by somebody trying to you know, do that to her, but they don't. The movie resists that. And the movie resists a lot of really big emotional moments that you go into this movie thinking to yourself are going to be there. You go in thinking that that's going to be a big dramatic moment, and they resist that throughout. And it's mostly just this quiet, elegant, beautiful drama that does use that as an element of suspense, but doesn't go there. And in the end, it just allows these movie, this movie to, to ride on the grief and the dignity and the sadness and the, 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 the beauty of this uh, woman just finding this new relationship with her family again after 20 years. And it's really just incredibly lovely, incredibly well acted. It's one of my favorite things I've seen this year, and not just because it has you know such a big trans theme to it. Because I love trans people. I'm a big ally of trans people. It's a, it's an important topic to me. So I was kind of on the side of this movie from the beginning. But the movie is so much better than than I ever would have imagined in terms of just how it's artistically presented. That it just it moved me even more than I expected it to. Is it in theaters now, or is it streaming somewhere? I think it's just in limited release uh, I, from IFC right now, so I think it maybe it's just in limited release in like the the big cities at the moment. Yeah, because I saw that trailer a few weeks back, and I I don't know where I saw it or why, but I I want to see it really bad. Uh, it's beautiful. I, I recommend it so much. I'm assuming you haven't seen it, Jeff. I did not see it. Right. I'm a bad podcast host. Well, I don't think it's around here. <laughs> Oh yeah, you have to, it has to be available for people to see. <laughs> I'm sorry for bringing it up for most people who can't see it, but just taunting. I did us. want to talk about it because it is it's just so lovely. And I do want to get the word out. I hope more people, I hope plenty of people got a chance to see it and will get a chance to see it. Uh part of the reason I get to see, you know, wanting to see the earth things as early as possible is the opportunity to find a movie like Monica and tell people about it and tell people to go see it. We'll have to bring it back when it's available. Uh, another movie I'm looking forward to seeing but haven't seen is Blackberry. Yes, uh, Blackberry starring Jay Baruchel and Glenn Howerton is the story of the Blackberry phone, uh, the one of the first, uh, you know, one of the first smartphones. Uh, back in was it 2003? Uh, this thing gets off the ground fully, and how it got there is a series of compromises and ugly business deals and a lot of cheating and lying on the part of Glenn Howerton's character. Uh, and these are all real people who are, most of whom are actually still alive. Uh, and, uh, th- but this is one of those rare movies that doesn't seem to pull any punches because this is not a movie that's kind to uh, to either of these two men at the center. You've got Jay Baruchel's character who's this uh, genius inventor who wants to create a product and it, that is perfect it's his desire to create something perfect and obviously perfect is the enemy of profit uh and so he gets in business with glenn harden's character who is this guy who's just take no prisoners yelling screaming angry all the time but he always gets things done he gets deals done and getting deals done means getting money in and getting money in means building better products and what's amazing about this film is that that dynamic is so good but also that it's just about the pace of technology and the way that technology changes changed so quickly. I mean, you had the BlackBerry become this uh, piece of technology that was everywhere for a time. And then when iPhone comes out, it's just dead. <laughs> and you can watch the BlackBerry guys just kind of losing their mind when they see the iPhone come out and like, what are we going to do now? Like they're, they're so unprepared for the rest of the market to arrive where they are. Uh, that they and inevitably they get, uh, you know, just run into the ground. A BlackBerry is around. Rim, the company they made, is still around in various different forms. But the various different things, like the business cheating, especially that uh, the, that Howerton's character did, uh, just making promising people millions upon millions of dollars that he didn't have. Uh, it, it just it, it's it's very funny to watch that play out as it does, and the other character is kind of going. I mean, we're never going to get paid this amount, but we're going to get some of it, so why not do it? 
<laughs> the pragmatism is great. The humor is sensational. This is a terrific movie. Did you get to this one, Jeff? <laughs> uh, I got to one movie this weekend, and that was what we're going to talk about later. Um, I actually, I a friend of mine had a screener of this, and I was about to be able to watch it, but then they canceled. Um, I just remember... <laughs> When you were talking about how they were totally unprepared for the iPhone, Sean, that yeah. when a bunch of my friends had Blackberries and they were like, oh, this is the best thing ever. It's going to just totally revolutionize everything and there will never be anything like it. And when the iPhone came, and all the, like, the different smartphones and stuff started to come out, I was like, yeah, there's nothing like it. It's better. Shut the fuck up, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I never got the appeal of a BlackBerry because it was I, I you know it was just bulky to me and all that. But so I was really interested to see this movie and I was really excited that I almost got to. And then, well, you know who I you are. The, I know you're listening. I love this, that this movie touches upon something that was a big part of the BlackBerry experience for a lot of people. And I never had one myself, but they, I heard people talk about this: the clicking sound of the BlackBerry. People yep. loved the clicking sound. It's one of the things oh, that yeah. they bring up in the movie is how people, when they took away the clicking sound, people were like, "No, you have to have the clicking sound <laughs> of the buttons." I'm like, "I have to have that as a feature." So when they went to digital displays. They had to put the clicking sound on the digital displays in order to make it more appealing to people. Yeah. Another plot point is like uh, they they go to they once they find out that the blackberries become a hit. They, they find out that people have been calling them crackberries because in New York there are like guys who could not put them down for anything. They mm-hmm. were just staring at them constantly, and of course, Howerton's character loves that and. Uh, Jay Baruchel's character kind of freaking out about that because, like, he doesn't feel the product he's perfect enough, and that's kind of his flaws. But eventually, like, he he becomes corrupted to a very very unique degree where he has he's forced into becoming the businessman part as well as this the genius inventor part, and it, that's a really fascinating character arc that Baruchel goes on as well. And then Glenn Howerton, I had no idea. I barely recognized him through part of the film. I was like, when is Glenn Howerton going to be here? Then I realized he's the bald guy. And I didn't recognize him because he shaved his head, not all the way, but just like at the top, very top of his head. And I didn't recognize him. So I I actually interviewed Glenn Howerton and and Jay Baruchel last week. And Glenn Howerton said that he actually shaved his head for the movie. I'm like, that's insane. I can't believe that. I almost didn't recognize you. (laughs) <laughs> was he a hard guy to interview is does he goof around the whole time or does he take it pretty yeah, seriously he, he was very cool he's very very calm uh yeah he t- takes everything very he took it pretty seriously he didn't joke jay <clears throat> baruchel made it impossible <laughs> because not because he's a bad guy he's a great guy but he says the f word all the time in every <laughs> sentence and i'm doing a i'm trying to record an interview for the radio so that made it a bit difficult but yeah he was still great though <laughs> that's fine so it's basically one long bleep <laughs> <laughs> just in jay's part yeah he just basically well you know what talk to your talk to your uh boss and see if we can get it on here <laughs> so we don't have to bleep it. yeah unedited <laughs> uh <clears throat> now I'm looking forward to seeing that as soon as I can. I know it is in town, but uh, life. <laughs> anyway, our classic this week is The Holy Mountain. 1973, Holy directed by <laughs> Allah. Uh, yeah. Before you go any further, when I, I watched this with a group of friends, and uh, one of them who listens to the podcast said, I just want to hear Sean try to describe this. <laughs> <laughs> so have fun <laughs> <laughs> directed by Alejandro Jodorowsky uh, and uh, tells tells a story of uh, of something and then this <laughs> happens and then a guy sits in a cloud of his own shit and then <laughs> yeah, I, th- this is this is phenomenal this is an amazing film actually uh the 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 allegories here are numerous. Like there are numerous different things that he, that uh, Jodorowsky is commenting on. It starts with a guy who kind of looks like Jesus, but is also asleep in his own piss and shit. 
<laughs> but once he realizes he kind of looks like Jesus, he st- starts thinking he can make some money. So he take, he's like taking pictures, carrying a cross. He's got tourists taking pictures of him carrying a cross. Uh, then he gets made into a ceramic, a bunch of ceramic Jesuses. <laughs> and, but he's upset with that. So he destroys them, but keeps one, which then turns into cake as he eats its face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Communion. <laughs> I, this is this is ha- this happened. Um, yeah. I no, actually, I do love this movie though. Like it, honestly, it reminded me uh, of kind of a little bit of the experience I had with uh, with Bo is Afraid with the uh, actually all the Ari Aster movies where the imagery is just so strong that it feels like it's acting upon you, like it's physically affecting you, um, like somebody reaching into your brain and giving you just a little push. Uh, that's Jodorowsky. Uh, the imagery is just so strong that even as as bizarre as it is, like it, you can't describe it. I mean, you can, but it doesn't. It sounds like you're making it up. It sounds like you're just coming up with something. Like if I told you that there was a giant robot vagina that was stimulated with a giant wooden dildo <laughs> to open up and then give birth to a smaller robot vagina, you'd think I was insane. It sounds like the ramblings of a person on the street corner, but it happened in this movie and it, the visuals are incredible. Um, and you kind of, you just have to, you just kind of marvel that anyone could have thought to, to commit this to film. Uh, this movie came about because the Beatles gave Jodorowsky a million dollars to, and said, you know, Hey, do what you want, you know? <laughs> and this is what he came up with. Frogs eating lizards is an example of the Spanish defeating the Mayans. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's what's on. That was in his head, so he put it on film. Uh, and then it all ends in the most amazing way with Jodorowsky, you know, taking these characters to the holy mountain and think they think they're going to find out about the secret to eternal life, and then he tells them, "No, we're just in a movie, and this is a movie." And, Pull back the camera, and you guys are, hey, you're watching a movie. <laughs> and again, it reminded me of the ending of Bo is Afraid. <laughs> right. It's like, no uh, more movie. Go back to life. Yeah. <laughs> Get back to life. I, I think this is absolutely, absolutely kind of brilliant. And that's a double-edged sword, because there's a lot of people who are going to just look at this and just go, it's pretentious crap. And I understand where you're coming from, if that's how you feel. I get it. Because <laughs> it is an int- it's it's the movie that that invites you into it. You have to take part. You can't inactively watch this movie. You can't passively watch the Holy Mountain. You have to allow your mind to go inside it and interpret what you're seeing. You know, like just try and figure it out. Uh, visually, it's like a it's like a different language, and you're having to just sort of interpret what you're seeing and what it means. And if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to reveal yourself in that way by you know giving your interpretation of what you see you're not going to be comfortable watching this movie <clears throat> what did you think jeff i thought this movie was like if you fed the, the jesus christ superstar to an ai and said rewrite this but then you actually fed it some lsd at the same time this is what <laughs> you would get um <laughs> when I so a few weeks ago I just I was scrolling through Twitter or something and I just saw this incredible image that I thought was so gorgeous but you know how Twitter or Instagram for that matter how it just refreshes while you're looking at something mm-hmm. it refreshed and I could never find it again and then I started the movie last night and I was like holy shit that's what this <laughs> that's what it was <laughs> it was the opening scene with you know with the alchemist with the huge hat the black hat in the black and white background, I was like, Oh my God, that's what they were talking about. And then I was furiously trying to find that post. And I never did because Twitter is a garbage dump. <laughs> um, yeah. I tried to find that post cause I wanted to see what they had to say about it, but it just, it from the opening moments, I was so like, Oh cool. I found this to, Oh my God. The, you know, and that's what I thought. I thought of Bo is afraid where it's like, Every, you're in on it, but they're not, you know, it's kind of like you're, 
I was going to say, like you're watching a movie, but you're <laughs> watching <laughs> beside, you're actually watching a behind the scenes movie. Um, so many penises, not in a good way necessarily. Um, <laughs> I, I, lo- I liked the, the scene where each of the, you know, the, the Holy council people are being introduced and, you know, they're kind of mm-hmm. crucified on the wall. And then you, you think that they're actually naked people, but they're really just kind of, I don't know if they're wax figures or if their faces are just covered in wax or, but it was just the visuals were so striking. I kept like wanting to go back and rewatch parts of it. And then I was like, that's kind of pervy. Um, but it wasn't really for pervy reasons. Uh, I, I was both like attracted and repulsed throughout the movie in equal measures. Mm. Um, you know, the, I read about the uh, the chameleons and the frogs and how they would have to literally film the chame- chameleons for a couple hours just to get any movement because they're so still. Um, so <laughs> I'm watching that, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, they're destroying it, and the blood is everywhere, and the lizards and frogs are rolling around in it. And I was like, wow, I, I actually kind of feel that. That's how my day-to-day kind of is. Um. Yeah, just incredibly visual, everything about it, and that, it, and when I started watching it, and I, you know, I was like, okay, this is Jodorowsky. It's kind of probably going to be a little pretentious and probably be a little like non-narrative, but there was actually a narrative to it, a uh, like a Salvador Dali kind of narrative, but a narrative nonetheless. Um, I think that. You know, the visuals of like, like you were talking about the giant mechanical vagina and the, the uh, burn your money and he slips the money in his, in his sleeve. And, you know, just like, oh, I kind of, I wanted to, there was a few things where I was like, okay, a little less visual, but a little more story. But then as I got into it, I was like, no, I kind of like just the visual. It was kind of like, reading a comic book without very many words. Mm. So. Bob? You know, like I said, I watched it with a group of friends and the four of us are going to the concert that inspired me to pick this movie. And so, you know, being familiar with the album, the band's King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard and the album's called Nonagon Infinity. And they got songs like called Robot Stomp and Gamma Knife and People Vultures and all these things that Wawa all the stuff that shows up in this movie at some point. Uh, And it was just kind of cool to go through and pick it out as we went. Uh, I highly recommend, especially if you've seen this movie, at least have fun with the record or maybe even watch their series of videos that kind of go along with the movie. Just inspired by it. It doesn't add anything to it, but uh, it was fun to watch with people, especially when like my wife kept apologizing for what I subjected everybody to. Uh, <laughs> but in a lot of ways, it's their fault because they showed me the band. So, but <laughs> uh, I mean, right out of the gate, the scene Jeff was talking about with the long, bl- that weird black hat and the two girls in front that he like strips and then shaves their head, you know. <laughs> I don't know if it was my wife or my friend's wife. It's like, we're not doing that in Colorado. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was just, uh, but beyond all that, you know, you're watching every scene unfold and it's like Jeff said, you're not expecting a narrative. And I didn't really notice it right away that there was a narrative. And then all of a sudden it was just like, I don't want to say a quarter into it, but a little bit bef- before then, but a, a little ways in, you start to realize that, okay, this is actually all going together. It's not just scene after scene. And it is pretty easy to follow, you know, once you're done. <laughs> you know, it's not <laughs> as complicated as it looks. But it is, like you guys both said, visually it is so impressive that it, I think it's what I like about this more than other super pretentious movies, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think um, we'll end up on a list? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of children in this movie. That made me. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it, I think the, yeah, I loved I loved parsing it. I loved parsing the themes. I love that you know this is a very political film. It's a very leftist political film in many ways. Uh, very suspicious of you know people. It's all you know. There's a lot about corruption and a lot about the evils of capitalism in it. And uh, but at the same time, you know, you've got Jodorowsky casting himself as as essentially like the only authority figure. You know, he's the director. The director is the only authority figure. And uh, he's the only one who's <laughs> he's the only one you're supposed to trust, even though you're not supposed to trust anyone in terms of the of the, uh, you know, the social order when it comes to people in power and power. So it's it's very I, it's almost ironic in a way and, and almost a joke in and of itself, uh, as, as is the way he sort of portrayed his character. <laughs> Well, his character is called the Alchemist, which when you get down to it, that's kind of what a director does. You know, they're in charge of, you know, putting all the ingredients together to make the potion that's the movie. And when you, you know, you're like, oh, the Alchemist, does this have like, is this some sort of weird uh, Camelot inspired? And then you're like, no, it, you know, is it? renaissance or whatever no it's he's a director oh okay i get it and the way he was directing everybody you know around the council table as the alchemist Mm -hmm. and then at the end he's the director and you're like oh i see what you did there (laughs) yeah it's like it's like the director is starring in his own film and as the director as literally as being the film director starring in his own movie which is a yet another level of meta that makes this movie kind of brilliant yeah and i hadn't really heard of this movie other than uh i'm sure when we watch the D- jodorowsky's dune the documentary they talk about it i don't remember that but if i'm reading it right once this didn't get a screen for like several decades after it came out is that accurate i believe uh, what happened was that yeah george harrison controlled the rights of it for a long time and and he got some advice from somebody that said it was something this weird and and artful that it might be more valuable if you hold on to it for a while and don't let it out in the public so he wasn't necessarily keeping it out of the public eye for any any reason for it wasn't because it was bad or or shouldn't be shown it was that he thought they all thought that it would be more valuable if it was scarce and uh, and so they made it scarce for a long time do you know that george harrison is supposed to star in the movie i think i read that yeah he was actually supposed to be um the jesus figure but he his i think his agent objected to the scene where they're washing the guy's anus that one like, <laughs> none of the yeah. other scenes just that one <laughs> well especially that he said he didn't want to do that one and joe Dorowski said no you have to that's you know that's a big part of this movie which i mean let's face it it's really not it's just you don't really see anything but i don't think that i could i i can get behind george harrison saying you know what if you cut cut the scene of my asshole out of the movie sure i'll do it but well, I mean, the guy that they did get to play that character looks like George Harrison in 1973. <laughs> I mean, it really does. True. It's a really strong resemblance. He looks so much like the guy who played uh, Jesus and Jesus of Nazareth in some points. I'm yes, like, he does. what is it the same guy? And I had to look it up and it's not. But that would have been I was great. Like, <laughs> Talk about a character introduction. There he is laying in the ground, pissing himself. <laughs> Covered in shit, mm-hmm. flies on his face, <laughs> children throwing rocks at him. <laughs> I love that when they when they were throwing the rocks at him and they crucified him and they threw the rocks at him and then he like woke up and jumped up yeah. and scared everybody away. That was pretty funny. I liked his little friend. He had a little friend who has no legs and <laughs> yeah. no hands. Look, but, Mom. Uh, could, could light a cigarette with the best of them, though. That was mm-hmm. hilarious. And I don't know, like, I I remember watching Jodorowsky talk in that documentary, and he just seems like he's out there. Like, 
Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'd go so far as to call him a genius. He's definitely a weird artist, uh, but he makes for a. I mean, you can't ignore it. You're definitely not going to be bored watching this. You're either going to turn it off because you can't handle it, or you're gonna yeah, you're gonna enjoy it, or you're gonna get through it and not know if you like it or not. But uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready to put him on Ari Aster's level. Uh, I but it is definitely a unique experience, and I'm glad we did it. He's, he's a I, different. I, I, Go ahead, Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, he's a different type of director. Like Ari Aster makes movies that generally make sense, right? <laughs> you know, they have a they have a strong narrative push, and the themes and symbols are not necessarily subtle um, to most people. Um, whereas Jodorowsky, he's his stuff is it's art first, movie second. You know, the way he frames stuff and even, you know, that opening scene where the guy, he's wearing the huge black hat. And I mean, that's a, I look at this movie and I'm like, okay, that could be a painting. That could be a painting. Mm -hmm. That could be a painting. It makes me really want to watch Santa Sangha, uh, a movie he did in the eighties. My, I used to live with a guy who was obsessed with that movie, but he was like, it's really hard to get into. And I, I'm like, oh, I'll watch it someday. And I remember seeing it in Fangoria back in the 80s, but I've never watched it. But now this seeing this makes me want to watch that. Have we done El Tempo yeah, no, yet? I, uh, no, no. I mean, I think we'd remember if we did. <laughs> I mean, I know I've seen it, but it's been... I don't remember doing it for the show. I don't remember doing it for the show. No, but I want to see Stalker. Uh, I saw Maggie Mae Fish on YouTube. Brilliant uh, essayist to do... A piece on stalker and that's that movie looks incredible but uh, going back to the whole ari aster comparison for a moment uh, ari aster is incredible and certainly i'm not going to say that jodorowsky is better or worse but the uh, they're different but they evoke the same images in my head like they made my brain feel the same way my brain folded up about halfway through this movie in sort of a like a painful <laughs> sort of feeling and i had to pause for a second because i I wasn't confused. I was just kind of in awe and just kind of shaken by what I was looking at. And that happened to me in Midsummer, and it happened to me in Hereditary and it happened obviously in Bo is Afraid as well. That's similar, very heading, heady sort of disturbed feeling. I needed to take a breath and I could during those movies. I couldn't because I saw those all theatrically and uh, for the first time when I saw Ari Aster. And so that I, I just had to sort of live in that feeling throughout. Uh, if I had to le- see this movie in the theater, I would have been messed up pretty bad. <laughs> um, and it's that same kind of feeling. It's a movie that acts upon you. Like you have a physical, visceral reaction to this movie and you have to participate. It draws you to to be part of this, to to enter yourself within it. And that's not something that a lot of people enjoy. I And I truly understand that. Not everybody wants to have that kind of experience, um, right? And so that, but 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 with it, with that comparison, like Aster does, Aster also works in genre, so he's you know he's telling stories that are a lot more easy to relate to. Joe Dorowski is very different; as he's just making like he's kind of image first, and then he wants you to figure out what you think of the image. He has maybe a point that he's making with the image. But he also wants you to go, what do you think this means? And that's kind of yeah. it's, it's like it's like going through an art gallery and just kind of, you know, looking at the paintings and figuring it out instead of having the artist sitting there and telling you what it is. You have to figure out what you think it means. And it's going to mean something different to everybody. Uh, yeah, Jeff, how did you take the, the robot vagina scene? <laughs> well, you know, me and vaginas. Um... <laughs> I, I kind of like watching it. I was, I was kind of like, okay, are we, is it, is is it because it's industrial? Is it an allegory for how, you know, people are just machines now and, or, you know, then how we're just cranking out machines out of mechanical vaginas. You know, it's like, that's that's how I kind of took it, and I, yep. 
as I thought about it, I'm like, well, I don't know if I'm right or if, but then towards the end when, you know, he's, everybody's told their story and he's said, okay, we've got to do this now. We're going to do this now. And, uh, you know, kill your, kill your friends, throw them overboard. And, um, and then it's a movie. Mm -hmm. I think that that kind of lends a little credence to that. We're just churning out. And especially nowadays, we're just turning out product. Everything has to be commodified and even vaginas. Yeah. And that's, I mean, there's a similar idea to that as well as the earlier story about the man who has a a thousand wives, each of which is pregnant. Like it's a similar, mm -hmm. there's a similar idea there. That's a, that's certainly that commodification of the birthing process is, is certainly that's something uh, that Jodorowsky had in mind as well. Um, there's also like towards the end, he's there's somebody who was telling me of their interpretation of the near end scenes where everybody's shaving their heads and, you know, losing, you know, turn, they, they turn in their clothes and their money and they give up everything. And they're talking about transcendentalism. They're talking about it, uh, how to transcend and they're talking about ego death and, I thought that, wow, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> and then, then of course, it, is it about that or is it about just the, just fucking with these very, very rich people? <laughs> that, there's an element of that, too, just kind of fucking with the super rich who you, know, you have everything. And there's this one thing left that I think I, that you don't have that I can give you. And that he uses that to draw them up and take everything from them. And and then tell them, oh no, wait, that doesn't actually exist. Go back to life. <laughs> it's it's funny that you st say that because that just made me. We were having a conversation about like billionaires and the worship of billionaires and mm. how easy it is to fool a billionaire into doing something incredibly stupid, like by Twitter. Um, <laughs> you it, but how people will simp for billionaires and you got, you know, all these people that are, you know, running around and you see the, like the kids pelting rocks at this guy. And then he becomes a tool for billionaires or, I mean, I'm just assuming billionaires, these people who have more money than sense. And then they are able to, the, the alchemist is able to just be like, ha you guys are fucking idiots. <laughs> and I, so I think, yeah, that's let's see what we can get these people who have more money than sense to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I love that. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> I love that. Go ahead, Bob. And I mean, I, I, you know, back to what you were getting at earlier, Sean, is, you know, you mentioned seeing the Ari Aster movies in the theater and not being able to see this one in the theater. Uh. I have a harder time <clears throat> at home getting lost like I do in the theater. And then you throw in the fact that I watched with a group of people, I think prevented me from truly getting lost in it. Uh, like I probably would have, if I was alone trapped in the theater, uh, at the same time, my preference is more of a, you know, I, I story to me is the most important part. And if art's mm -hmm. before the story, I'm always going to lean to the the people who go story first. Uh, that's probably why I said I won't, I'm not ready to put them on the level of an Ari Aster. But I mean, at the same time, I put them ahead of like Terrence Malick. Uh, yeah. Personally. Uh, anyway, it's not to make this a whole compare who's better at what <laughs> then. <laughs> I just don't mm -hmm. know how to do anything else because I'm terrible at this. <laughs> <laughs> We disagree with that. But well, if fine. you would prepare, Bob, I mean, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you didn't have a life and a family, Bob. You know, <laughs> why don't you give up everything <laughs> for the podcast? We promise eternal life. <laughs> oh, I already shaved my head. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I would love, I'd go see this in like a special screening. I don't know that would ever happen around here cool. but well, the, maybe we can make it our special screen at the end of the yeah, year you do black christmas than this <laughs> oh god i don't what i don't a, know if I, what a honestly, though, I don't know if i want to see this in the theater because i don't know if i want to see this in a space where i can't get up and walk away for a little bit because this is like i said this movie acted upon me while i was watching it like <laughs> i i was feeling it and and 
it, I was made uncomfortable by it, but the, in a, in in a way that I, I was I was in, entertained by and and moved by and intrigued by, and I did go back to it, uh, you know, after after a break, <laughs> and you can't do that in a movie theater. <laughs> yeah, I was just there was definitely things that uh kind of disgusted me at times like you mentioned the kids like i wish that didn't have to be in the movie uh Mm -hmm. but uh yeah just a wide variety of reasons why uh why you would be moved or affected uh from positive to all super negative It, it definitely you're i definitely see what you're saying and again watching with a group uh, especially a group that wasn't as one of the other people my friend was he was into it but the wives were just kind of there to make fun of it and so so you got to kind of fight through that when you're in that atmosphere uh, mm-hmm. but yeah it's i'm glad i saw it i'd like to watch it again anything else yeah, did, on the did, holy mountain did. The shit scene fucked with me. Like I, I have a hard time with shit in movies. It, I get, uh, I there, there are a few shit scenes that, like, I think are are interesting. <laughs> like Hall Pass made me laugh with a shit scene. Like that, it, that that explosive diarrhea scene in Hall Pass is is a great joke, regardless of of it being about shit. Uh, but like Sallow, I I wanted to throw up during Sallow. Um. There's a Formula 51 with Samuel L. Jackson has the most disgusting scene in movie history. It made me walk out of that movie. It was just an explosive diarrhea scene that I just like I got up and walked out. So I, I have a I have a like there's a scene in the movie College I think where they're doing ass shots like they're pouring the 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 liquor down an ass crack for somebody to drink. I walked out of that because I can't deal with that. Uh, <laughs> Like I don't deal well with that element in movies, and so that one really fucked with me. And and he really leans in on it and makes it about the shit <laughs> turning to gold. And so that was hard <laughs> for different reasons. The other stuff was you know hard for other reasons, but in the end, this is a very I found this to be a, a, an experience I'm I'm happy to have had. Yeah. Do you have a favorite shit scene? In- <laughs> Zach and Mary. <laughs> I mean, this one, it was effective. I mean, it did what it wanted to, it did what it wanted to do. Uh, yeah. But I could have done it, but it. That definitely had people judging me when we got to that scene. <laughs> uh, as if, as if you knew that was coming. <laughs> I mean, or did you know that? I didn't coming? know it was coming, but you at this point you had seen it and started sending us your text messages about what uh, you were going through, and so immediately I compared it to Sallow. So then I, <laughs> so it was in the back of my head as a possibility. Pissed himself, and he did look like he'd already shit himself. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else before we move on? Not for me. All right. 1993. We've got Carnosaur, Excessive Force, Lost in Yonkers, and Posse. Did you watch Carnosaur, Sean? I did. Carnosaur, yeah. Uh, um, uh, Adam Simon directed. Uh, it's di- the director of Brain Dead. Uh, it's, it's, it's unwatchable. Uh, this movie <laughs> is really awful in so many ways. Uh, it's incomprehensible. Uh, the, the, it has a plot that makes no sense. Let me try. Diane Ladd is an evil scientist who is creating genetically engineered dinosaurs via chicken eggs, but she's also created a virus that infects women to give birth to dinosaur eggs. And then the dinosaurs kill the men and her goal is to eliminate humanity and replace humanity with dinosaurs. I think (laughs) because sometimes men get sick with this virus, but they don't give birth to dinosaur eggs. So that doesn't make any sense. (laughs) I don't, this would be so terrible. It's so bad. You got the little puppet dinosaurs running around, which they're not 
bad puppet dinosaurs. They're pretty good for being you know, hand puppets. <laughs> but it, I, the backstory of Carnosaur is so much better than the movie. Roger Corman found out that Steven Spielberg's next movie was going to be a dinosaur movie, so he scoured like a bookstore trying to find a book that had dinosaurs in it. And he found one and he bought the rights to it. And then he gave it to Adam Simon and just said, I don't care about the book. Just write a movie about dinosaurs and we'll just say it's based on the book. And, and he made this movie in 18 days while Steven Spielberg, while the the promotional stuff for Jurassic Park was already in their way. People knew Jurassic Park was coming in the summer and they made this movie in 18 days and put it out before Jurassic Park came out. <laughs> so it was like a mockbuster before the blockbuster even happened, which is, a, it's a hilarious story. Uh, and, and I mean, even casting Diane Ladd was just, it was a way to say, Hey, Diane Ladd happens to be Laura Dern's mom. <laughs> You know, and Laura Dern is in Jurassic Park. So, yeah, get Diane Ladd. <laughs> There's a scene in the movie with Diane Ladd that, like, first of all, she's she was there for five days making this movie. That's all she gave it. Five days. Uh, she <laughs> she's not acting at all. She's not even wanting to be in scenes with other actors. She's interacting with them through like a phone or like a, a dear com. She finally has to interact a little bit with Raphael Sabarge, who plays the lead, sort of lead character in the movie. But, it, but, but finally, when her when we get to her end game, she starts laying down this blanket on the floor and it's like, no, no, not Diane Lane. She does not give birth to a dinosaur. Not Diane Ladd. No. <laughs> she has too much dignity to give birth to a dinosaur. Then she gives birth to a dinosaur. <laughs> Everybody's got a price. <sighs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Did it was it successful? Or not? I mean, I guess he makes them so cheap; it's almost impossible not to be, isn't it? It only cost eight hundred forty thousand dollars to make in eighteen days. I I think it made money. I assume it made money. They made they made three Carnosaur movies, so it must have made some money. That would be a yes. <laughs> Jeez. What about the other ones? Excessive Force, Lost in Yonkers, Posse. Any memories of those? I vaguely remember Posse just because I was a fan of Mario Van Peebles and it was like notable. Like they marketed it as the the first black Western. But that's pretty much all I remember about it. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, Excessive Force, they tried to they tried to make Thomas Ian Griffith happen and it didn't happen. <laughs> All right. Well, America ne- roundly rejected Thomas Ian Griffith. Yes. <laughs> Next week we have Fast X. Our classic is May, which we were going to do this week with the Holy Mountain, but I didn't watch it because I'm an asshole. Uh, in 1993, Hot Shots Part Duh and Sliver came out. Oh, Sliver. Yep. That's next. <laughs> I was <laughs> Next on the free show. Obsessed with that movie. Really? You want to join us, Jeff? You can join us next Sunday. Um, we'll just see how my work stuff goes this week. <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> All right, we can do a little bit of flick chart before Jeff has to go. Just tell us when you're done, Jeff. Just a uh, quick, I'm, little bit. Yeah, a little we'll bit. Go for a a little minutes. bit of admin uh, on the '93 show. We, we Carnosaur will be next on the '93 show. We are still doing Dave. Uh, MJ wasn't available uh, this weekend to record, so uh, we do want to have, have MJ on with that one because they really did have some uh, very cool things to say about Dave. So Dave is still on the list, but Carnosaur is next. Right, cool. Wrong turn to Among Friends. I've never seen Among Friends. Me neither. Wrong turn to Beavis and Butthead do America. Beavis and Butthead do America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's go Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> yeah. A simple plan, Mr. Woodcock. A simple plan. A simple plan. Both Billy Bob Porton movies. Yep. Batman v. Superman, Dawn of Justice, Scarface. Batman, Batman. and Superman. 
A Christmas Carol 2009 Battle Royale. Battle Royale. Battle Royale. Absolutely. 10,000 BC, The Birds. The Birds. The Birds, definitely. Jumanji, Batman 89. Batman. Batman. Rain of Fire, Black Swan. Black Swan. By a lot. Anchorman 2, Scenic Route. I'm not familiar with Scenic Route. No. Looks very cool. Anchorman 2, Psycho, 1960. Psycho. Psycho. Yes. Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, Friday Night Lights. Friday Night Lights. Friday Night Lights. The Purge, Godfather Part 2. Godfather Part 2. <laughs> Yes, the Godfather Part Two. I I was tempted to say the Purge just to fuck with Sean, but uh, the English Patient, Honey, we shrunk ourselves. We haven't <laughs> seen that, have you? I've never uh, seen it. Okay. <laughs> English Patient. Reese Two. Reese Two. Reese Two, because it has Michelle Pfeiffer singing reproduction. It's shorter. I'd rather watch it. <laughs> BMX Bandits, The Lost Daughter. The Lost Daughter. The Lost Daughter. Mm. Rules of Attraction, Hitman. Rules of Attraction. Yeah. Rules of Attraction. Not as good as it should have been, but... No, but it has Kit Pardue naked in it. <laughs> Blade Runner. Blink if you miss it. Blade Runner, The American President. It's tough, but I'm going to go Blade Runner. Yeah. I worry that my memory of the American president might not live up to it. <laughs> yeah. Wizard of Oz, Vampires. I mean, Wizard they're of Oz. almost the same movie. <laughs> Wizard of Oz, of course. Dolomite is my name, Blue Velvet. Dolomite. I did not see that. It's very good. Uh, Blue Velvet is not very fun. Uh, Wall Street, Coming to America. I don't really like either one. I don't, I don't care that much about Coming to America, but I did enjoy Eddie Murphy doing 15 different characters. So I'll say Coming to America. Me too. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, <laughs> Billy Madison. Crouching Tiger. Sean... Billy Madison should be the one you're embarrassed to like over Spanglish. I don't like Billy Madison. But yeah. I'm saying, if you're going to pick an Adam Sandler movie, Spanglish <laughs> is not a bad movie. There's no reason I to be embarrassed Spanglish by that. I'm a little embarrassed by liking Span- Spanglish. I am. Huh. Uh, either it's way, about other people's percep- It's about other people's perception of you liking it. Oh, uh, Okay. Brewster's Millions, Best in Show. Plus, if you met an Adam Sandler fan, they're not at all embarrassed about liking that movie. This is true. The Nice Guys, a Sandlot. The Nice Guys. The Nice Guys. Mission Impossible 3, Heartbreakers. Mission Impossible 3. I've never seen Mission Mission Impossible 3 because it's Tom Cruise. I don't care, so whatever. Uh, Donnie Brasco, Cabin Fever. Donnie Brasco. Yeah, it's a better movie. Although I don't mind Cabin Fever. I like Cabin Fever. And it's not really fair to compare it. It's like a $100,000 budget. <clears throat> Recount Monsters vs. Aliens. Monsters vs. Aliens. Yeah. Sure. I think it's there's trauma response to recount. I don't want to think about the 2000 <laughs> election again. Uh, I don't want to think about any election again, but that's all it- especially with old people in it. Uh, Moana and go. Go. Go where? Yeah. Go. <laughs> Heavenly mm. creatures. Amores Peros. Amores Peros. 
It's tough though. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna say Heavenly Creatures just because I just listened to a book about that the true case. And so recency bias, I guess. So I'm gonna pick Heavenly Creatures. I'm gonna go with Morris Peros. I like that director a little more. Keeping the faith faith force forces of nature. Forces of nature. I like Ben Affleck. Yeah. Yeah. Spider-Man 2, 2004, Bachelor Party. Spider-Man 2. Spider-Man 2. Although Tawny Katane. <laughs> Love Tawny Katane. Dead Man Walking, Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette. Yep. I'll vote against anything Susan Sarandon's in lately. <laughs> she just pisses me off. Fast Five, the score. Fast Five. What do you say, Jeff? Uh, uh, fast, fast five. <laughs> I, I didn't hear him. <laughs> when Harry met Sally Ray. When Harry met Sally. Mm, yeah, when Harry met Sally. Uh cartoon all-stars to the rescue it's not a movie what the fuck <laughs> it's, a, it's a tv anti-drug special Star Wars. Uh, featuring all your favorite cartoon characters the last jedi donnie brosco the last star wars jedi. the last jedi oh, donnie brosco <laughs> sorry bob no it's my favorite star wars movie uh easy a red dragon easy a red dragon fantastic for me it's Fantastic. great, but I love Red Dragon. Did you know how incredibly tall uh, Edward, uh, what's his face is? I, I'm going to call him Edward Furlong, and that's not his name. Um, <laughs> he's incredibly tall. Hmm. I saw him at a pizza joint in New York City one time. Oh, <laughs> Blair Witch. Fascinating story, I know. <laughs> Blair Witch Project Cinderella. Blair Witch Project. Yeah, Blair Witch. Agreed. Uh, deceptive mm-hmm. Practice. A TV documentary. Oh. oh. I don't watch TV. Boiler Room, True Lies. True Lies. True Lies. Boiler Room's not that good. 500 Days of Summer, Adventures in Babysitting. 500 Days of Summer. Adventures in Babysitting, not the Disney Plus version. Yeah, I I can't let nostalgia go. The Money Pit, Stepmom. I don't like either of them, but Money Pit. Money Pit. A baby Driver, Roadhouse. Roadhouse! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Roadhouse. <laughs> never Say Never Again, Elf. Uh, elf. Yeah, Elf has Amy Sedaris. And Zoe Deschanel. <laughs> Avengers, Age of Ultron, The Princess Bride. Now, I'm I'm picking The Princess Bride, but it's not because I don't like Age of Ultron. I know I've been very negative about Marvel movies, but I did enjoy Age of Ultron. But I think Princess Bride is just a better movie. Princess Bride. I'll go Princess oh, Bride. I really love that poster. I actually hate Age of Ultron. That's when I started disliking the Marvel movies, so I'll... That's why I'm picking that one. Uh, American History X, The Fighting Seabees. I've never seen The Fighting Seabees. American History X, Star Wars, The Force Awakens. Force Awakens. Force Awakens. We'll go American History X. Just Married, A Knight's Tale. Knight's Tale. Yeah, Knight's Tale. Rudy, Legends of the Fall. Rudy. I think it's shorter. (laughs) Yeah, both of these movies are just no thank you, but yeah, Rudy. I'll go Legends of the Fall. I hate Rudy so much. Uh, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days from a House on Willow Street. Never heard of From a House on Willow Street. How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. Fishing with Gandhi. Are we done? (laughs) (laughs) 
All right. Uh, That's our show. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff can get back to work. <laughs> yeah. Go back to the office. Good night, all. All right. Good See night, you, everybody. Thanks. Bye.